The light heavyweight division is in the final stage of healing. It was a train wreck not too long ago, but we have a champion now, and a former champion who never lost the title looking to reclaim it. UFC 300 will be headlined by two actually deserving fighters, a double champion in MMA and kickboxing, Alex Barrera. He's just so different than anybody else. The man can put people's lights out. Defending his title against someone who has a legitimate claim of being called champion, Jamal Hill. And I still feel I'm the champion. The pound for pound best women's MMA fighter in the world, Wei Li Zhang, defends her strawweight title against Yang Shan Nan. And this is the first time two Chinese contenders have faced off for a world Mini title. lightweight tournament to the side, the next lightweight contender plays out on the main card. Max Holloway, being the badass that he is, takes on the BMF champion, Justin Gaethje. You know, Gaethje, if you don't want to wait around, we can do one. We can do one for the fans, you know? While Charles Oliveira tests the most promising new contender at 155, Armin Sarukian. I'm just thinking about now Charles Oliveira and then like title fight, that's it. And Bo Nickel faces another test, this time under the brightest lights of his career. Maybe not main card worthy, but this is still the UFC 300 we deserved. Welcome to the fighting business. This was one giant undertaking, but we made it here. After the prelims deeper dive, behold part two covering the main card. This is what I wanted, no freak show fights, but actual battles worthy of taking place on the biggest stage possible. Popularity, entertainment, hype, mystique, and potential. Near guaranteed savagery, there's something for everyone on this card. Five fights to cover yet again, but I'm not complaining one bit. Fighting business, absolutely amazing. One of my favorite new channels going right now. Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. The first fight on the main card features Bo Nickel, the monstrously successful college wrestler turned MMA prospect, and his opponent for such a grand occasion is Cody Brundage. Bo Nickel, Cody Brundage. Let me bring you up to speed. Cody was a Dana White contender hopeful, but he was knocked out and sent packing. He found his way back into the UFC as a replacement fighter at UFC 266. He lost that too, but I guess Dana White appreciated him for taking the fight. And since then, he has remained with the company, mostly showing up as a replacement when someone pulls out of a fight. With a 10-5 record, the guy is decent, but good enough to give Bo a challenge? Maybe. On paper, Bo outclasses Cody in every way possible. Having a new obstacle in fighting was like so refreshing and exciting for me. And I think people sometimes get scared to have a new obstacle. But more promising hype trains have been derailed in the past, and this is another small test for the promising prospect when it could have been more like against an actual respected gatekeeper. Bo has obviously like some higher pedigree in terms of competing. You know, he's a multiple time NCAA champion. He, he's competed on the world stage in wrestling. I'm the best guy this guy's ever fought. It's not even close. I guess the intention here is to popularize Bo to the casual fans, and this fight will accomplish that objective. Why isn't Yuri on the main card again? Anyways, Charles Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian. There has been a special tournament going on at 155 for the past few years, and I believe it's at its conclusion. It's been the old guard versus the new blood, and at UFC 300, this chapter concludes with possibly the best lightweight of the old guard, Charles Oliveira, facing the most promising new lightweight on the roster, Armin Tarukian. As we look at UFC 300, Charles and Armin are obviously gonna fight each other. Who do you think wins it? Since 2018, Charles has been near perfect, shredding through the lightweight's rank and eventually becoming champion. The defenses against Dustin and Justin put him on the same level as other lightweight greats, but Islam ended the long winning streak at UFC 280. But that wasn't the end of Du Bronx, not even close as he came back, murked Benil Dariush, and the rematch talks with Islam began. Charles versus Islam Makhachev 2 in Abu Dhabi a year later. That's kind of what sounds like Dana's planning. It was a done deal for UFC 294, but Charles withdrew due to a cut. It looks like he'll have to earn it again, this time against Armin. I'm leaning towards Armand because it's a three round fight, I believe, right? Yeah, because it's a three round fight, I think Armand, uh, I think he's going to win the early rounds. And then I don't know if Charles wins, it'll be more later on. Armand's first fight in the UFC was against Islam. Sounds like a disaster, but surprisingly, Sarukin did very well. He did not win, but Islam was not able to steamroll him like he did all the other lightweights. Since his UFC debut, 
Armin has lost one fight against Gamrot, and he's the only contender from the new guard who actually won when it mattered. That KO against Daryush made it clear. Armin is the best out of the bunch. And his reward will be being locked in a cage against the most lethal lightweight ever. How do you have 20 submissions? How do you submit 20 of the most dangerous people in the world? Tarukin is one of the few guys on the roster who can hang with Charles on the ground. That's how Islam beat Charles, by knocking him down and keeping up the pressure so he wouldn't be able to recover. But Armin is not as defensively aware on the feet, and against a berserker like Charles, you'll constantly be in the danger zone. Why are you going to be victorious, and why is it Armand Sarukian's time to shine and get that title shot next? Because I'm the best on this division, and uh, I'm going to show everybody in the UFC 300 I'm the best. Oliver himself doesn't have the best chin, but most fighters simply cannot keep up with the lethality and pressure he brings, and he ends up finishing the other guy first. Armin has passed the skill test long ago, but at UFC 300, the most dangerous guy in the division is going to test his durability and heart. I'm a well-rounded fighter, you know, I can do everything. So grappling, I can strike, I can do whatever he wants. So that's why I'm confident and uh, I'd say this is the next contender, but there's another important lightweight clash on the card. Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. It's 2024, and Justin Gaethje is the rightful number one contender at 155. The man doesn't seem to slow down no matter how much damage he takes. After his second championship loss, we thought he was kind of done at the top level. But he came back, beat the new guy in Rafael Fiziev, and knocked out the gritty and tough veteran in Dustin Poirier. Maybe you call luck. I'm down with it. Well, Justin, enjoy this, and I can't wait to see you fight for the title again. Congratulations, sir. Justin Gaethje! By beating the latter, he captured the BMF title and secured himself a shot for the actual belt down the line. But the UFC needed the human highlight on a card this important, and Gaethje is risking it. His BMF belt and his title opportunity. His opponent is everyone's favorite fighter, someone with unlimited cardio and an unbreakable chin. This is a huge fight, you know? Like, like I said, I'm all about building legacies and to be able to be a part of a big crowd, a big card in like UFC 300, it's gonna be a good one, it's gonna be amazing. Oh no, we've been here before. This fight seems like a bad idea for Max Holloway, who might not be risking his position in the division, but his overall health and well-being. We last saw Max Holloway at 155 back in 2019, and Dustin Poirier demonstrated a clear difference in power between himself and the featherweight great. Max Holloway stuck to featherweight after the loss, but now he's moving up again. The guy should be challenging Ilya Tapuria for the title, but I guess UFC 300 needs the blessed one as well. Max Holloway, Justin Gaethje, guys, let's start with this. Who do you got? I mean, start with that. At UFC 236, Holloway looked like a bloated featherweight, but the guy seems to be packing on the weight properly this time. Tapuria fight was uh, on short notice, so we didn't have a whole lot of time to actually add muscle. So a lot of the weight that he went into the fight with was, was not good weight. And he doesn't seem little in the first face-off against Gaethje. No matter how much he weighs, we know Holloway will have the better cardio of the two. But can he even get to the championship rounds against Gaethje? Um, I'm not sure, but I, I will go with, uh, with Gaethje because of... Uh um, of the weight. If there is someone who can shatter the legendary durability of Max Holloway, it's undoubtedly Justin Gaethje. Gaethje is just too much, too big, too strong, too used to the weight class, too gritty. Usually the smaller guy is the more technical and talented one, but Justin is one of the best strikers in MMA today, and Holloway is not going to have an easy time. He's probably in for hell for the first few rounds, but at the same time, if anyone can outlast and overwhelm Justin Gaethje, your best bet is Holloway. Max is taller than Justin, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's got a, he's, he's got a big build. He's a good size 55er. The massive 45er, good size 55er. Yeah. So, I don't, yeah, I don't think, I think that's to be a very, very competitive fight. You have to be really special to beat Justin Gaethje. We know Max Holloway is special, but enough to beat this lightweight god of war. We'll find out. Wei Li Zhang versus Yan Shaonan. Why is this such a badass fight? Let me tell you why. In the first actual title fight of the event, strawweight champion Wei Li Zhang faces Yan Shaonan in the co main. This fight was supposed to take place in China, but I guess the company was really desperate to stack this card with title fights. And personally, 
I'm fine with it. Five years later, we will see history being made again as Weili Zhang faces number one contender Yan Jinan for the UFC strawweight title on UFC 300. With Amanda Nunes retired, Weili Zhang represents the pinnacle of women's MMA, and she's facing the most deserving contender available currently. Do you think this fight will be a, a stand-up battle? Crazy to think that a few years ago, after her second loss to Rose, all hope seemed lost for Weili to become a two-time champion at strawweight. But then Rose shot herself in the foot with that horrific performance against Carla, lost her title, and eventually left the division. With Doug Rose gone, Whaley easily took the belt from Esparza and dominated Amanda Lemos in the first defense of her second reign. Whaley Zhang has 19 finishes and 24 wins. That's an 80% finish rate. She is tied for second most title wins in strawweight history. On the contender side, Jan murked Jessica Andrade in two minutes, and the UFC knew this was the fight to make. Now Jan, Jan is the first Chinese female ever signed to the UFC. She's got the most head strikes landed in a single UFC strawweight fight ever. And despite the somewhat lopsided odds, this won't be as easy as it looks. Usually, Whaley is the better athlete out of everyone she faces, but Yan has her beat in one attribute, speed. With her agility and striking skills, Yan might be the only strawweight capable of giving Whaley a tough time on the feet. As great and talented as Whaley is, she can be hurt, knocked down, and even KO'd. Wrestling and grappling is a possible plan B for Zhang, but on the stage as grand, I have a feeling, especially considering the fights before and after, these two will keep it standing and demonstrate why women MMA deserves a place on this main card. Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. These two guys are it. No way that fight sucks. Finally, in the main event of UFC 300, the newly crowned 205 champion Alex Pereira will defend his title against another champion who never lost and had to give up the belt due to injuries, Jamal Hill. Oh, I love it. Pereira versus Hill. There's a backstory to it. Glover Teixeira, the coach of Pereira, got a really great fight with Hill back in the day. So it's, it's fun to see this come full circle. There's a story behind it. I think it's a fantastic matchup. Let's briefly recap the state of the division. This disaster began when Yiri, who had beaten Glover to become champion, announced that he was relinquishing due to a particularly bad shoulder injury. Thank you for your messages. I have to say sorry to Glover. That's life. Jan Blachowicz and Magomed Ankalaev fought for the vacant title at UFC 282, but the fight ended in a draw, pissing off Dana White who announced at the post-fight press conference of the same event that Glover would face Jamal Hill at UFC 283. We do Glover versus Jamal Hill in uh, Brazil. That done? Done. In Rio, Jamal Hill silenced the crowd when he dominated Glover throughout the fight, sending him off to retirement and becoming champion. He thought we finally had order in the division. But then Hill was forced to vacate due to injury, and it all began again. Fortunately, during this unholy mess, a new contender emerged at 205, Alex Pereira. Bill cause problems at 205, and good luck to everybody else, because he's a mother to deal with, I'll tell you that. Boaton had moved up from 185, and due to his rivalry with Izzy, he was sufficiently popular, and just one victory over Jan, and he was in the title picture. Listening to an executive, Yuri Prohaska is the name on the tip of their tongue. I believe the title fight will be built around him. Yuri was also clear to return, and these two savages headlined UFC 295 and MSG, once again with the vacant title waiting for the victor. No draw BS this time, as Alex scored a TKO over Yuri, and became a double champion in under 10 UFC fights. At last, the godforsaken division found the champion, and no injury bug in sight. For a while, we didn't have any idea about the next step. Magomed impressed with his victory over Walker, and Hamza was obviously calling for a title shot too, but with UFC 300 coming up and just one actual title fight on the card, Dana White had to put something good together, and he did. The last fight announced for this card was Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill, something very few of us expected. But now that I look around, I don't see too many people complaining. It doesn't feature a mega star, but you know for a fact that this fight is not going to disappoint. Not with these two. You know how it goes by now. If you stand in front of Alex Pereira, you're most likely screwed. That left hook is nasty. It's, it's brutal. But I think Hill is one of the few folks in the entire company who can stand and trade with Alex. Do you think Pereira, you think Pereira can be that long reigning champion or? I mean, with Jamal Hill and all those guys out there, they're all so good and so close. With solid boxing fundamentals, movement, and crushing power, Hill is an amazing striker in his own right. And unlike Yiri, 
He won't rush headfirst into a firefight with Pereira and leave himself open to that left hook. He'll be cautious, but dangerous. I, I don't think he's. I don't think he's as fast as I am. I don't think he's. He's used to the type of fight that I bring mm. and the type of style that I bring. Speaking of danger, as good as Jamal Hill is, how long can he avoid the traps of the much more experienced kickboxer? Pereira doesn't just find an opening for the left hand, he lures people in and takes their soul. When he's not stalking you down, he's crippling your legs and making it even worse. But then every round starts on the feet, like yeah. you said. And every brown he's gonna chop that calf. And he'll beat you up until eventually he gets you. And Hill, who is returning from surgery, might not be able to take too many of those vicious leg kicks. Forget about either one shooting a takedown. Kickboxing is Alex's world, and Hill is pissed off and has said that he will knock out Poitain to prove a point. I'm talking about striking. Oh, you gonna knock him out? Yeah, bro. It's, <laughs> he, I gotta, I gotta, knock, I love it. I gotta shut his, him, uh, him down at what he does the best and put him to sleep. I don't see these two talking shit, but there is some underlying tension. Don't forget, Hill defeated Glover, Pereira's training partner not too long ago. And I expect these two to have the same stare down as Alex and Yuri did at MSG. Nothing disrespectful, but definitely malicious. Whatever curse is left on the belt will be erased. And at the end of UFC 300, the 205 nightmare will be over and we'll be looking at the true king. Will this on paper easy layup for Bo Nickel backfire? You either get the ones that are given to you or you choose choose the obstacles that, that you take. At the end of the night, which bloody and battered lightweight will be declared the next challenger for the crown? I never looked at UFC 300 as a microcosm or possibly even a little finals bracket in the lightweight division, but it appears to be that. Can Jan pull off the upset against the best female fighter on the planet? Her last fight was the most dominant statistical win ever in UFC women's history. Finally, who will lead the rejuvenated light heavyweight division? So you really just don't understand the threat that I am or, or the challenge that really is in front of you. All these questions will be answered on the biggest card yet. It might not be loaded with star power, but in the context of a pure sport, this is going to be legendary. Get YouTube SEO Masterclass, editing, breakdowns, all previous and upcoming videos, music, playlists, downloadable thumbnails, your name in these wonderful credits, and so much more on Patreon. Have a look at it right here. And with that being said, I gotta bounce. Catch y'all in the next one. Peace out.